It's a great pleasure to introduce our, our speaker today. There's a chair up here. Uh, I don't see any others. It's this one right here next to our speaker, who we all well, know, Michael two Oppenheimer, chairs. our distinguished uh, chair professor of geosciences and international affairs. Uh, the title tells you he's a distinguished scientist and a discerning commentator on, on, on climate uh, policy issues. He has a PhD in chemical physics. I didn't know that until I looked you up with, from the University of, of, of Chicago. He's a, a, a leading scientist on the IPCC, National Academy Reports, uh, co-editor of, of, of Climatic Change, and the author of a book he's going to speak about, Discerning Experts. Thank you, Thank you Bob. Thank you for coming. So, um, Thank you, Bob. Thanks, everybody, for coming. I'm going to speak about environmental assessments in the context of a book we've written. Uh, here are my, let's see, did it work a minute ago? No, no, it's not working. OK, we'll use this. Here are my co-authors, uh, Kanan Bryce, who is uh, now an, uh, an, an editor and is in, uh, associated with the University of Alberta, Matt Schindel, who's a historian at the uh, the chief historian at the Air and Space Museum of the Smithsonian, Jessica O'Reilly, who's a professor at uh, University of Indiana Bloomington, uh, Milena Wojcik, who's a historian who wrote a book on Einstein, Naomi Oreskes, who I probably don't have to introduce to you, and Dale Jameson, who I probably also don't have to introduce. Naomi's a historian, and Dale is a philosopher on of climate change in particular. Let's go back. Uh, these are the sponsors. We had, were lucky enough to get a couple of grants from the National Science Foundation, the High Meadows Fund, which generally support, uh, uh, generously supports numerous activities around here, and the uh, universities that uh, the various people belong to. This is not the first uh, um, research project related to scientific assessments, in particular the big, uh, we hope influential scientific assessments which have developed over the last uh, 35 or 40 years. Bill Clark of Harvard ran a project that Bob was associated with, I know, um, uh, the Global Environmental Assessments Project, I think it was called, which was really the first comprehensive look at how assessments influence, uh, what the conditions are which lead assessments to be influential with governments. Another person has written a lot about um, Domestic government science advice interaction is Sheila Jasanoff at Harvard also, and there have been many, many others going much further back in time. Those two, I think, were particularly influential on the thinking of some of the authors in this project. So what's different about our work? I think this is the first project to look inward rather than outward. The other uh, considerations of environmental assessments have examined Again, what makes an assessment useful to policymakers? What are those characteristics? This one tried to focus on the experts and the processes within the assessment itself um, which influence the judgments of the experts. How do experts deliberate? How do they reach judgments about what are matters of fact, what uncertainties are, what are areas of ignorance, and what are the um, what are the uh, factors within the structure of the assessment itself which influence those decisions? Most scientists probably believe that the outputs of assessments are more or less independent of the institutions under which they are conducted uh, and are certainly independent of the particular people in the room. And I, that those are just not true as far as I was concerned going into this and I'm more, con uh, more convinced of that going out of it. Uh, there is a considerable, there, there is, almost, I should say, there's almost no literature on expert group deliberations. It's very, very sparse. Probably the best known piece of work in this area is Michelle Lamont's How Professors Think, which has nothing to do at all with How Professors Think. The publisher <laughs> probably invented that title so it would sell books. It's what got my attention to begin with. But it's really about how groups of experts get, get together and deliberate. And this was an internal look at their deliberations around uh, private philanthropy foundation grant decisions. Uh, there's also a very big literature on organizational institutional factors. That's a very substantial literature. Bob knows a lot about it. 
and both are relevant in the context of our study. And then there's a literature on misjudgments, ac accident literature. Uh, if any of you are looking at the Boeing 737 episode, there will be a million books written on this, and it's very, very important, has a lot of lessons which come out immediately if you've read the accident literature about institutions, how institutions in, uh, interact with expert advice they get, how they influence the experts, so it's a two-way street, and you know how all that influences outcomes. I won't go into it further, but my entree into this problem had a lot to do with the accident literature in, in addition to my own experiences with assessments. Uh, this is only, I'm, oh, this book only reflects part one of a much longer, uh, much larger project. Uh, it, uh, part one, um, I'm sure, let's go, part two is dealt, uh, is based on actual ethnographic observations. That is, we had ethnographers sitting in, an ethnographer sitting in on consensus panels of the National Research Ac uh, Council, National Academy of Sciences, in addition to interviews and archival work which was what uh, uh, the, which is what phase one of the book is based on. Um, the primary players on the phase, on phase two, uh, the primary player is Matt Schindel, who was the ethnographer who sat in on five panels. I won't talk more about that because although the observations are done, the data hasn't been analyzed. There's a phase three, which is that after knocking on the door of IPCC for years, we finally got permission to cite ethnographers on several uh, components of the IPCC expert deliberation process. Uh, we cannot sit in on actual chapter author meetings, if you know how IPCC operates, but we are allowed to sit in on the proceed on the um, plenary proceedings where the authors get together and decide what the the, make the final decisions on what, what are the facts of what's going to go in the report. For obvious reasons, namely I'm still an IPCC author, I have recused myself from that part of the project, uh, and, but the rest of the, the people involved are named at the bottom, with Jessica O'Reilly being the main. Uh, something's wrong there. Part of that slide seems to have disappeared, but basically the method of part one is uh, primarily interviews and archival work because it was historic. Oh, it's a time slide. I didn't purposely arrange that, but let's go. <laughs> 47 new interviews. I never do it, but it happens sometimes because I click the wrong button on the PowerPoint. Uh, a lot of it, so the stimulation came, a lot of it came from ideas that came out of my personal experiences, but of course personal experiences only take you so far in trying to get a picture of what's really going on in assessments and a little bit of preliminary analysis, and we eagerly await the results of part two and part three where we actually got to see these deliberations directly before we make any grand sweeping conclusions, although I will make some at the end. We did three case studies, the National Asset Precipitation uh, Assessment Program, which was a U.S. program from 1980 to 1991, the ozone depletion assessments, which ran for uh, basically over a 23-year period, and a, a variety of assessments of the West Antarctic ice sheet running over almost a 40-year period because the issue is, is actually 20 years, uh, actually fi almost 15 years older than that. There have been assessments forever on that issue. And that last set involves IPCC, and some of our conclusions are relevant to IPCC, but IPCC is only one of three stories or cases that we talk about. Um, why did we pick these cases? Because those are something that the three PIs on the uh, NSF grant actually knew something about from previous research experience. They're notable cases of big international assessments on critically important issues. And uh, not the least is they had overlapping expertise. There were some people, some experts who were involved in all three assessments. And, that, and the communities that were involved were similar, so we didn't have to worry about questions of whether we were asking things that were relevant to a set of physical scientists sitting around but had nothing to do with a bunch of psychologists sitting around. I think it will make the initial interpretation more limited in its value but also uh, easier. Uh, there are limitations on this study. It's got a U.S. bias in terms of 
being weighted towards assessments that were either primarily U.S. or if they were international, had a lot of U.S. participants. The, num the numbers of actual assessments involved is not inconsiderable, but the, it, it, you know, it probably goes up to about 15 or 20 uh, actual assessments when you count all the West Antarctic ice sheet assessments. Uh, but there's a limited, you know, they're, they're all focused around three problems. So it's not clear how generalizable the insights are. Uh, again, in phase one, no direct observations of the deliberations. And interestingly, no observations of the author selection process, which is a, a, an organizational issue, which is pre pre precedes the assessment, which is very interesting and which we will have access to, I believe, with uh, IPCC, and we did, I think, as I recall, with the Academy. So again, and, and then finally, it would be nice to get a political scientist on this team at some point, Bob, if you have nothing else to do. You want to go back into the assessment business for these other phases. Um, my, just to put, lay it all out, my biases, my, this is my personal experience with assessment, started back a long time ago when I was a member of an ad hoc committee chaired by John Deutsch, who was later uh, had several big time appointments in the federal government, including head of the CIA, uh, to assess the National Asset Precipitation Assessment Program itself. And uh, it was a White House uh, committee, and it, it gave me some insights into the organizational aspects of assessments that are hard to get if you don't actually sit in one of these things. I've been uh, involved as an author in ver of various types with the IPCC since the first assessment report. Uh, and uh, I've also been involved in two special reports. I'm currently on a special report, and I'm involved with the sixth assessment as a review editor, and then I'm going to hang them up. I will have had enough. Uh, in 1994, I was on one of the ozone assessment panels. Uh, 1997, 2009, I was on a couple of NRC panels, which were relevant, one to climate, one to ozone depletion. And uh, I want to issue this disclaimer before you think I'm being too hard on IPCC. I think IPCC did a fabulous job at what I think, in my view, was the main thing it was supposed to do, which was keep governments from going to climate negotiations when they're supposed to be talking about political matters and arguing about what the science is and it's taken that completely off the table. Uh, on the other hand, and, and uh, also on the plus side, IPCC, if, if you line up all the facts in an IPCC report, and there are you know, tens of thousands of them, so nobody's actually ever done this exercise, and looked at which ones are contestable in some sense, you would probably find that IPCC has taken 95% of them or more and, and made them, push them over into really fundamentally incontestable terrain, except for the most hard-nosed of contrarian skeptics on the climate issue. However, there's a few percent of the issues which happen to be really important because they have large uncertainty. Therefore, they're the ones that are contestable, even by experts. And a subset of those involve really high risk. They involve big things that could happen, like disintegration of an ice sheet. So when you combine uncertain science with big potential impact, you get a messy picture. And you get one where, yeah, it's hard to do a good job. It's hard for assessments to do what they were asked to do. And that is basically the case with these three situations that we chose to study. Uh, it's not the reason we chose to study them in the first place for all of them, but with uh, the, uh, the West Antarctic ice sheet and somewhat with ozone depletion, it was a motivating factor. Uh, why did I do this? Um, you know, I got into IPCC originally because I worked for the Environmental Defense Fund, and we wanted to know what the hell was going to go on inside these assessments. It was kind of interesting that a bunch of scientists were going to go off and make decisions that were going to affect everybody in the political sphere eventually. So I offered myself up, and the first <laughs> reaction I got from Bob Watson was uh, it was the F word, but he uh, changed his mind. and. Uh, they let me into the process, eventually let other NGO experts into the process, and now you can find them all over the place in IPCC. Um, and I got entrained in it because it was a very appealing thing to be doing. It was exciting to be, go to one place, one-stop shopping for all the latest science. Uh, and uh, it was very exciting and it appeared to possibly be influential. And you can argue that it has been influential in some way, although not as much as I think most of us hoped. 
I, uh, beyond that, I, with this project, I wanted to get beyond my own experience and frustrations and try to get an objective view of all this. Not only could I not be all over the place in these assessments at all times, seeing what went on in all chapters and all facets of the enterprise, but you know, my own personal anecdotal experiences only go so far uh, when you try to really figure out what's going on and, and have a, a, a trustworthy analysis of the situation. And mostly I want to figure out if there's some way we could improve the process. Here are some preliminary conclusions, since I may not finish this talk. Uh, I put them at the beginning. Institutional arrangements matter. They matter in a very big way. From the choice of authors to the organization of the report, simple things like which chapter comes first, uh, or whether there's a chapter about a subject at all. The choice of subject matter, the way that the sponsors outline what they want to hear about, the questions asked, all of that is determinative to some extent. It's very influential, I think, on what the actual decisions that the experts make, therefore with the picture that the public gets about what the facts are. There's an inherent conservative bias in the process. There's kind of a knowledge inertia because it these things have gotten, these assessments have gotten institutionalized. And because they're institutionalized, the institutions have their own prerogatives, their own way of going about their business. And the incorporation of new knowledge is difficult. And some assessments insist, particularly IPCC, that their authors stick to what's in the peer reviewed literature. Fortunately, that's never really abided by, or hardly ever because it, it would cut the legs out from the value of some of these assessments. Other assessment panels, like the Natural, uh, the, uh, National Research Council panels, have, been much more, have felt they're liberated and been much more creative in many senses in doing what's essentially new research, doing the goings on of the panel and making decisions based on that new research. Uh, and a third conclusion, the consensus is a problematic model, although uh, panels are run lar bar by and large with the consensus model. That is, they have to agree on, a, on, on you know, what the facts are in, and what the uncertainties are. Uh, in the end, what you wind up doing is cutting the edges off the distribution and not uh, giving uh, information to policymakers about basically extreme outcomes, which turn out sometimes not to be extreme, but to be much more common than we think they, they would have been. And, um, there is a direct, uh, and to go back to a point I already I just made, there's kind of a lack of creativity associ associated with a prohibition against developing new knowledge during a, uh, an assessment. Uh, and this raises the question of what actually is the nature of what comes out of assessments? Uh, what is the nature of knowledge? Is it just a review? No, it's more complicated than that. Is it just a review with some ev evaluation, usually, but sometimes there's actually new work that's in there. And it's important to understand what the status of that knowledge is compared to all this stuff that's been in the literature for three, five, or 10 years that has been reviewed and was subject to the, the, uh, the battering that new information gets by other science that later comes out. So what is it that uh, assessments are actually producing in the way of knowledge? And how does it fit with scientific research as we know it? And this is just a quick sketch. I did it on New Jersey Transit this morning on the way down, so don't view it as, uh, as final by any means. But so the way you might roadmap all is there are institutional arrangements which affect the expert deliberations. The red hour is supposed to indicate those deliberations, and there's some stuff that's purely internal to the deliberative expert process, but which is clearly affected by the arrangements. Then you come out, and somebody's got to write a summary. And that's a very complicated process which we did not go into comprehensively in this book, although there is quite a bit of discussion of it with regard to the acid rain case. And the summary is the thing that's politically contentious and where the institutional arrangements uh, intervene again. So for, particularly with regard to IPCC, the governments themselves have a say so in the final wording of the summary. That, that's an interesting and complex story. We do not go into it for IPCC in this book. That'll have be handled later. And then you get conclusions. So kind of figuring out all the hours of influence in this process is important. The thing that we most focused on was the, circle, the red arrow circulating around an expert deliberation and the arrow connecting institutional arrangements to those expert deliberations. 
There's a prehistory to this that is long before the post-World War II period. There were lots of assessments going on. We like to point to the example of trying to distinguish uh, uh, you know, a saint from a, a demon. And who did that? Who were the experts that were called on? You could laugh at it today, but maybe they'll be laughing at the way we choose experts in uh, 100 years. I don't know. Uh, but it's a way, you know, a way to gain, gain important insight into policy-relevant problems. They, there was a way to do it. The modern assessment might have started up in the uh, 18th century. One example is a French military assessment uh, of um, new weapons technology and its value and w what the government should do in terms of spending its money and allocating its resources and, and changing the way the military was arranged and how, that, how it was arranged relative to, to industrial society. Uh, there was an influential assessment. They were relevant to today with the, the famous vaccine assessment of the Royal Commission on Vaccination uh, in uh, 1896 in the UK. What's notable about both these assessments is the experts weren't asked to go in a room, pretend they have no understanding of policy, and then make ex particular judgments based on technical issues. They were expected to come forward with policy recommendations. That's an aspect of assessments which has kind of drifted away, and it, IPCC has banished it entirely, except in indirect and uh, um, sort of indirect ways in which it, it, it effectively does make policy recommendations, which I'll talk about in a minute. But IPCC has an injunction against being quote unquote policy prescriptive. Uh, the the um, what's interesting about the vaccination uh, situation is. Uh, the, this is smallpox was the issue. The commission recommended to, it was asked to compare vaccination versus public health measures like sewage and cleaning up streets as a measure of uh, protection against smallpox. And uh, they came down in favor of vaccination, although there was a dissent, a couple of dissents allowed, which is again something you don't see that often in modern assessments, although it can happen. It's, it's, it's discouraged it, with a view toward getting to consensus. And they, the two recommendations they made were the key ones, vaccination is good, better than public health measures. Uh, number two, stop arresting people who don't get their children vaccinated, which is interesting and still relevant today, by the way. Um, so uh, th that was that process. Uh, which was uh, of getting, of not telling the experts to shy away from policy um, was until very recently the norm actually. Uh, Post-World War II, the, uh, the National Academy of Sciences, National Research Council uh, really uh, started creating assessments all over the place. There were like 250 of them performed by the, underway at the academy at any one time, 250. Uh, of course, they're small panels compared to what IPCC does. And uh, from 19, the 1980s onward, we got the, these increasing numbers of large formalized international assessments, which are a different breed for a variety of institutional reasons. Now let's go very quickly through the, key, uh, the uh, three case studies. Uh, the National Asse uh, Asset Precipitation Assessment Program was created by Congress in 1980, partly as a deflection to keep, uh, to put off political action on, on uh, acid uh, deposition. It was structured, uh, interestingly, differently than uh, recent assessments in that it had a big research component. It gave away a lot of money, mostly to the f 20 federal departments who were running the, acid, the, uh, the, the assessment, and then it was supposed to assess the knowledge produced by those, uh, research, by those research programs in the context of all the other research that was going on on uh, acid rain. So it was a conjoined program, Very, you don't see that much today. In 1991, after 10 years of research and assessment and a half a billion dollars spent, it published a report. The trouble was that the US revised the Clean Air Act, which was the thing that was supposed to be the target of the assessment uh, in 1990. So it missed its departure point. A lot of people thought it was a failure as a result. In fact, it stimulated a lot of useful research. And by the way, the, uh, let's see if I can get that back. No, there we go. No. I might need help on this from somebody who knows what they're doing. 
I don't know how to clear up the screen. Chuck? Yeah. There we go. Thank you. I knew that. Um, uh, but it was influential in the sense that the, the interim results of the report were discussed with the agencies. It was a, va a, a, a valuable thing in that sense to have the agencies running the assessment. On the other hand, the agencies made a muck of it in other ways because they constrained the assessment. Uh, this was all occurring under the Reagan administration that wasn't interested in acid rain, didn't want to have a scientific report that came out and said that uh, acid rain was a significant problem. And as a result, the, the client, which was the government, which was also running the assessment, basically influenced the assessment in a way to make sure that the product was uh, as, as of its least value as possible. Now, I'm going to just pick out one episode that exemplifies this. Uh, transport modeling of pollution, pollution plumes from power plants was relatively young then. So, um, and the key questions were, if you, if you emit sulfur dioxide at this point, how much acid rain does it cause at that point, hundreds of miles away? And more generally, if you reduce emissions from all point sources, will you create a proportional reduction in acid deposition? Or will something strange happen, like the atmosphere is so saturated in the pollutant that it'll just, you, the, the effect of the reduction will be seen a few thousand miles away over the Atlantic Ocean? and not over the northeastern United States, which was a target of the program. So uh, EPA went about funding the development of a model called RADOM, Regional Acid Deposition Model, which is supposed to solve all these problems. RADOM wasn't in usable form until the late 1990s, not only at, long after the Clean Air Act was passed, but long after uh, NAPAP had shut its doors. So, uh, on the other hand, again, you know, the community got a product out of it, but it was not useful from a policy point of view. And it was sort of structured that way, unfortunately. It was bound to be a very long-term project that wasn't going to be finished in the timeline that it was uh, designated. And the failure to finish the timeline uh, the, 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 um, the, the, at regional asset deposition model mean that, meant the asset integrated assessment didn't have very much to say about a big part of the problem. So it sort of was one of the, the, the uh, bricks in the wall, which was the cementing of the failure of uh, NAPAP. In the meantime, the National Academy of Sciences put up a panel in 1983 to ask the very same set of questions. And they realized nobody cares that much about what happens at one point source. What you care about is the regional effect. So they went about answering the question from that point of view, did some clever internal research, which was publishable research, and uh, you know, would have made the journals on its own, would have been fine, and which solved the linearity question. It said, yeah, if you reduce emissions in, the, in the, the Midwest, you'll get an overall proportional benefit in terms of reduced acid rain. That was really all that needed to be known by Congress at that point. So when wants to ask, why did the big multi-gazillion dollar assessment that was supposed to solve policymakers' <laughs> problems not get anywhere close to doing so over the 11 years of its existence, but the National Research Council putting together a, a small panel of maybe 15 people that had a remit that lasted a year and a half or two years, they managed to get to the point. It's because the clients of the big assessment, who also were the people who set up the institutional structure limiting what the assessment could or could not do, uh, had set it up in a way which was guaranteed to not produce a useful product. It, I'm being harsh about this. But that's basically the bottom line. Uh, and the NRC panel, on the other hand, the clients of that, the sponsors of that panel were a bunch of foundations who, one, were interested in actually seeing, getting some policy useful result, and number two, who, because of the way the academy was structured, had no influence on the actual operation of the panel. The people who were running the assessment were the same people that had to go back and be yelled at by their, uh, by their what are in other government's ministers when they went away back from assessment meetings and had, were answerable to their bosses in Washington. So it was a prescription for not getting the best out of the process. Um, in it, so we had the problem of no pull from the government because the Reagan administration didn't care. And we had an, an, exam, an a case with no push either because the scientists were just happy because NAPAP was shoveling all this research money at the very same agencies. They were getting their programs funded. They didn't have the power nor that much the interest to fight 
over getting a decent assessment out. And so, again, a, 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 a recipe for failure. Um, this I've more or less covered. I don't have to go. I've talked about that. So let's talk about ozone depletion. There's the assessment process began in 1985 with a... Uh, what's called the SIAP assessment, the U.S. Department of Transportation. In response, again, it's kind of weird, but it started in 1975 because it wanted to examine the effect of supersonic transport on, on the ozone layer. But in fact, politically, it, uh, the supersonic transport was already dead by 1972 or 3 because Congress voted against it. This was complicated. The, the, main, the issue of ozone depletion by, by uh, supersonic transports was only one issue of several, including sonic booms as the planes move over land toward the airport, the uh, e economics of making a plane which wasn't going to make a sonic boom over land would, would have to reduce its speed, and sonic booms over the ocean driving whales crazy. All of that figured in, plus the cost of the whole thing meant the only people who could fly on it would, were well, what today would be multi-billionaires. Uh, so politically, it wasn't going to catch fire. Uh, but it keeps coming back. The proposal is coming back again. Uh, not surprising in this era, of course. Um, the U.S. National Academy of Sciences and the U.K. Department of Environment conducted several surveys. Again, these mixed science, mixed science and policy, with experts being asked to venture some judgment about the implications for policy. We'll discuss the ups and downs of that later. Uh, uh, the UNEP did it a set, the first international assessment in 1977. Then UNEP with the World Meteor UNEP is the United Nations Environment Program got together with the World Meteorological uh, Organization, two UN agencies, and established a framework for ongoing assessments. And the first of these was reflected in what's called the Blue Books, a mammoth UNEP WMO NASA assessment, which really brought the assessment pro up. Uh, process to a high point in ozone uh, and really is a, a thorough documentation and assessment of the problem as of 1980, late 1985. Unfortunately, the ozone hole was discovered in 1985. And so the whole thing had it not be thrown out but started over again. But this, this process of iterative assessments in collaboration with the development of policy during the development of the Montreal Protocol is the gold standard, at least it's regarded by the experts and many in government as a gold standard for doing an international assessment around complicated problems. And one, the person who probably deserves the most credit is the guy who dropped the F-bomb on me, Bob Watson, uh, who uh, started as a NASA scientist, who started developing the ozone, the assessment process that we're familiar with today through IPCC. Uh, during the ozone assessment development in the early 80s, uh, the ideas that came out of those, some of which are Bob's, a disproportionate amount of this uh, in the book uh, will be Bob's reflection. So some of it, probably really the ideas were somebody else's. And Bob is not giving full credit. We don't know because some of the people, unfortunately, are no longer with us. So we couldn't interview everybody. There are things where there's uh, no paper trail. And Bob's a brilliant guy, and he probably is responsible for most of these things. But I wouldn't be surprised if other people should be getting some credit in here, too. And I'll give credit to two other people in a minute. Uh, scenarios, emission scenarios, important and central to IPCC and the ozone assessment. Metrics, the metrics you pick to measure ozone depletion, the metrics you pick to measure damage are critically important. And that's part of the whole thing with institutional arrangements. The institutions call for the wrong metrics. You get information that's not particularly useful. Uh, in acid rain, for instance, the US defined an acidified lake as anything with a pH less than 5. The Canadians defined it as a pH less than 6. As a result, the whole swatch of damaged things, potentially, that were damaged according in, in Canadianese are not damaged in US ease. And you know, it's science. It shouldn't be that way. But yet, because of the framing of these, that aspect of the assessments, it ruled out a whole, focusing on a whole lot of science. Uh, the policy relevant but not policy prescriptive injunction is Bob's. Uh, 
trying to reach a, a consensus and is, well, that's not an idea he invented, but he brought it over into these international panels. And um, one other thing, trying to get broad participation from developing countries too. He didn't invent that, actually, was, I'll show you in a minute, is Bert Boleyn, who was the first head of IPCC. But Bob, Bob actually, I should say Bert brought it to a, uh, a high level as an important, a very important element of, of the assessment process. Bob was also sensitive, sensitive to it too, and if you look at the ozone assessments, there's relatively broad international um, participation. Um, the way to manage uncertainty through improvement, through iterative, iterative assessments was also an idea. It wasn't Bob's, but he managed that process. He made sure that assessments ran on schedule, delivered to the governments what they wanted in particular times uh, when they were supposed to, the importance of the executive summaries. Again, they didn't invent it, but they brought it to a fine art. And the dic the, importantly, the dictum, which I think is a mistake against performing new research, was also something that grew out of these ozone assessments. There are two other people who were immensely influential, Dan Albritton of NOAA, Bert Bolin, who was influential across a whole variety of areas, going back to the 1950s when he was a, a, did important work in the carbon cycle, uh, also with first head of IPCC, and he uh, directed the ship through uh, the, the sort of a new situation, and nobody knew whether it would be successful and the fact that IPCC is still going is, is uh, largely uh, his, uh, the, the pattern he set for guidance of IPCC and, and his uh, incredibly, both his stature and his calm demeanor in dealing with extremely contentious situations. So just to briefly outline what we, what we didn't know, what we did know about the ozone depletion situation, you know, ozone, the ozone layer filters out damaging ultraviolet rays from the sun. It's a prerequisite for the development of life at, on Earth's surface in the first place. Uh, the theory of gas phase chemistry and destruction of ozone goes back to 1974 paper by Mario Molina and Sherry Rowland. Then it was elaborated, the theory, over 11 years of research until the discovery of the Antarctic ozone hole threw the field into chaos because the gas phase theory said the uh, depletion would develop gradually over the course of basically 100 years, would be moderate, 5% uh, or so is the eventual number toward the end of the century. If emissions didn't grow much, if emissions did grow, it could be much bigger. And... Um, no one expected what happened when the ozone hole was identified, which is a, a large-scale depletion, and I mean a depletion that eventually got to 100% at certain layers in the atmosphere over a specific region occurring then. It had already occurred by the time they saw it. They saw it after it was a, uh, had been going on for 10 or 15 years, uh, because it's, uh, partly because Antarctica is a hard place to observe, and there was nothing in current theory that could explain it. Uh, also, on the political side, the uh, Framework Convention had been signed in 1985, just before the discovery of the uh, hole of the ozone hole, which would eventually lead to the development of the Montreal Protocol two years later. How did, they, how did scientists miss the ozone hole? Well, uh, what eventually the explanation was that heter heterogeneous reactions, that is, reactions that involve both gas phase molecules and molecules on the surfaces of, of uh, solid particles, in this case, complex, chemically complex ice, ice, crystal, ice crystals, accelerated the overall ozone loss. Uh, this is the kind of thing that, own, that not uniformly, not uniquely, but uh, in, uh, at 10 times as fast goes on in the polar atmospheres where there's a lack of observations. The early hints that something weird had been observed were, were dismissed as being too, uh, too odd to really focus on, and later, looking back at the records, it was obvious in retrospect that the ozone hole had been developing for some peri period of time. And interestingly, even though heterogeneous reactions were understood to be a potential problem, in addition to the gas phase reactions, uh, successive as early assessments dismissed them as too slow. One of the reasons they were thought to be too slow is nobody had the vaguest idea what surfaces would exist in the stratosphere, and that's because polar meteorologists, by and large, were not involved in the assessment process, and they knew there were these things called polar stratospheric clouds, 
which contain the ice crystals on which the reactions occur, but uh, due to the way the assessments were set up, and I'm not criticizing anybody here, because if I was setting up that assessment, I wouldn't have had the vaguest idea to put in a polar meteorologist, but you, it just it underscores the fact you have to be attentive to who's going to be going to the, uh, the experts that are drawn on. Um, the first international, significant international assessment was this Blue Book assessment. It was already underway by the time of the discovery. And what they said was, quote, it's premature for, for this report to do more than note it with great interest. That, I think, was a mistake. I think the assessors should have taken a little chance. And at least by, night, by the uh, time the assessment came out, there were larger things that could have been said, even though the science, is, science was developing rapidly. But it does indicate in some of these assessments a kind of a caution, a, a, a conservative approach. When I say conservative, I don't mean politically conservative. I mean literally conserving the current knowledge base and not pushing too far and sort of waiting, which I think isn't always helpful. Uh, of course, if you don't wait, you can make serious mistakes. But if you do wait, you make negative mistakes, as I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, sub subsequent ozone assessments got rather creative. They repurposed these metrics that had been developed basically to measure the amount of ozone depletion, to project the amount of ozone depletion into the future. Remember, the way we project things is we develop process-based models. And the process-based models had to be thrown out, basically, when the ozone hole was discovered. So in that gap of five or six years, when policymakers were demanding to know how much will ozone be depleted, how fast, in this new chemistry, uh, you know, the, the people who were running these assessments were very clever about finding ways to predict that, essentially developing new knowledge about what the future would look like, even though they didn't have much in the way of process-based information to go on. So this kind of thing about filling the knowledge gaps, as you'll see in the next example, is exactly what IPCC refrained from doing in the, waste, in the Western Arctic Ice Sheet case, and it could be done. My, my theory on this is the reason that the ozone assessors were, were willing to do it in a very high stakes situation was that A, the client wanted it, and B, they were a new institution. There were no ground rules. Watson was making it up, Watson and Albritton, as they went along. There was no rule that you can't do this. So they went ahead and did it. If, they, if IPCC, as it exists today, we're analyzing the uh, ozone hole situation in 1987, 8, 9, et cetera. It would be in a, uh, in a, in a straitjacket. It wouldn't be able to do it. Now let's get the third example up there quickly, the West Antarctic Ice Sheet. Uh, the, the gentleman in the lower, right hand, lower left hand corner is John Mercer, who I understand was an interesting character. He was also a glaciologist at Ohio State, the Polar, uh, Scott Polar Research Center. And he first came up with the notion that the Western Arctic ice sheet is unstable. In 1968, that paper was in a conference proceeding and nobody read it, except all the science historians who went back and found it later. But he then got smart, and 10 years later, he published a paper in Nature with the headline, A Threat of Disaster. Wow, that got people's attention. Um, the idea was the West Antarctic ice sheet, uh, which now is understood to contain about three or four meters uh, equivalent of sea level rise. Uh, could be unstable. Uh, it appears to have lost a lot of its ice in the last interglacial period. The last time Earth was about as warm as it's going to be in the middle of this century, uh, 125,000 years ago. The community split into two wings. One that says, ah, this is all a load of bull. Waste is stable. It'll take 1,000 years, 2,000 years to melt any significant part of it. And another fringe, which was like the hair on fire. This is, you know, this is happening. This could happen. We have to be serious about this. And that was the genesis of a whole series of West Antarctic, West Antarctic ice sheet assessments, starting with one in Orono at the University of Maine in 1980, uh, after the Mercer paper came out and got everybody worried. And what's great about this one, there's a 558-page verbatim transcript of everything that went on at that uh, assessment and the question and answer sessions. So for people who are doing archival work, wow. The current assessments, there's nothing. That's why we got these ethnographers to go in there. Because otherwise, there's no record of what went on. So this was a treasure trove. And one of the things that comes out of it, uh, by the way, Roger Revell, who you probably all know who he is, he, it was a big influence on this. Uh, Roger then was influential on the National Academy report that came out 
uh, three years later, which was the first comprehensive assessment of the climate change problem. And he wrote the, set, the chapter on sea level rise that other people contributed. Uh, but th this contains this famous passage about what would happen. In that, those days, they thought it was five to six meters. The oceans would, fl would flood all existing port facilities and other low-lying coastal structures. Extensive sections of heavily farmed, densely populated river deltas of, uh, of the world major portions of the states of Louisiana and Florida and large areas of many of the world's major cities. Now, ah, take that. And, uh, you know, that got people's attention. Uh, of course, we didn't know how fast that would occur. And so that was the key question. It wasn't wrong. It was the headline. But we needed assessments to tell us how, it, you know, how fast it's going to run. Interestingly, the executive summary of the assessment downplayed and tried to basically ignore Ravel's chapter. But then IPCC picks up the ball. Then there are a series of smaller scale assessments. IPCC picks up the ball with its first assessment in 1990. I'll just take a look at these uh, one after the other. Quotes from the report, within the next century, it is not likely there will be a major outflow of ice from West Antarctica due directly to global warming. Uh, that is, ice sheets can do weird things internally, and a little uh, uh, internal variability could do it. Global warming would have nothing to do with it if it happened, and it probably won't happen. Second assessment, AR means which uh, IPCC assessment. The likelihood of a major sea level rise by the year 2100 due to collapse of the West Antarctic ice sheet is considered low. And then even more, the third assessment, concerns have been expressed about the stability of the West Antarctic ice sheet because it was grounded below sea level. That causes instability. However, loss of grounded ice leading to substantial sea level rise from this source is now widely agreed to be very unlikely during the 21st century, although its dynamics are still inadequately understood, blah, 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 with the caveats. Uh, interestingly, just before that assessment came out, a bunch of observations had started to come forth showing something very weird was going around in, on in West Antarctica. But as happens in these assessments, the assessors were behind the time. And understanding why, and that's all about the framing, the rules, and some, to some extent, inherent scientific conservatism among, among experts. But then we got this whole decade of unexplained observations, some innovative modeling approaches, which showed much large, projected much larger sea level rise. And uh, finally, the fourth assessment was stuck, and it didn't know, the authors weren't sure, whether they should try to estimate what future sea level rise would be given these new uncertainties, or whether they should pull back. And at the last minute, after a lot of controversy, uh, discussion inside, pressure from the reviewers, they decided to pull back. Pressure from the reviewers mostly, as far as I understand it, to push forward. Um, model based, and they gave projections, but said this included the fundamental processes, which are called dynamical processes, which were the new ones causing all this accelerated ice flow. Basically, they then turned it over to the users who needed projections of sea level rise, people like the mayor of New York, or the mayor of San Francisco, or the mayor of Miami, or the governors. And the users improvised, and some of them made their grabbed estimates out of the literature without any assessment and used, and used them. And some of them used the partial numbers that IPCC gave, which were essentially had to be a lower bound to the true situation. Uh, <clears throat> Why did this happen? Our hypothesis is because the first time in the four assessment history of IPCC, there was no sea level rise chapter. The responsibility was broken up among four chapters, like observations of ice, paleo climate, you know, how much ice used to be, et cetera. And uh, there was never any one voice on it. Nobody came in and said, we have to reach some policy useful conclusion. Um, the, uh, and it's interesting that in the next assessment, based on a limited additional amount of scientific information, the fifth assessment actually did what we had hoped the fourth assessment would do, we, me, and a few other people, which is make an estimate of how big the dynamical term could be. And it had brought a lot of clarity to the situation. And the users were appreciative. Unfortunately, the science keeps getting worse, worse, bigger, in terms of the amount of possible loss. So the sixth assessment is faced with this problem all over again. So let's try to wrap this up by uh, bringing you some preliminary conclusions, These, because this is only phase one. We don't know whether these will still be uh, viable next time. Uh, 
the drive for consensus is not always the right thing to do. Some uh, assessments should be consensus assessments, and some of them should not, and some should be largely consensus assessments. But when you come to these problems that have big uncertainty but large risk, you really don't do policymakers any favor by trying to get a consensus. Um, it, you, you're much better off letting the authors have more free reign and not push them to a consensus unless the consensus happens to emerge naturally. Because you just take out information that the policymakers need. Um, this, you know, it wasn't always the case. There were, as I said, previous assessments where um, uh, uh, dissenting voices were not just heard but underscored. And I think we would gain a lot if we reconfigured at least some assessments. Try other models. There are other models. There's the Supreme Court model. Those guys, the decisions they're making are at least as important as the decisions the scientists are making. And, and we don't have trouble with dissenting opinions. In fact, they help. They help generate the next set of opinions. They're worthwhile. I don't know why we don't at least experiment. Uh, conclusion two, institutional arrange, uh, arrangements certainly affect the epistemic outcomes. The things that are decided as what is the knowledge are influenced by the arrangements. This again, this is based on a limited study of a certain type of assessment over, uh, you know, which is again a, with a U.S. bias, but I think you'll pro we'll probably find this as we go into additional assessments. I mentioned most of the examples here already in my talk how the organization is, uh, the, the sort of standards or metrics that are d dictated to be used, et cetera, et cetera, and who participates. It really matters who participates, who is considered an expert, what expertise is considered uh, germane, like the polar meteorologist I mentioned. Um, and the in individuals have biases, and that's something that has to be of, of concern. And, though, and even experts have their biases, both biases that are professional and biases that are personal, and all that comes into play when you're talking about group interactions. Um, assessments do create new knowledge. In each of these examples, there were examples of the potential to create new knowledge where it was done and move things forward, like in the NRC with the linearity question, like in ozone uh, uh, projections, use of metrics to project, which by the way is something that Ted Parson of UCLA first uh, noted. And um, the way I IPC, the uh, fifth assessment finally went about estimating the dynamical contribution. There are many, many, many other such examples. In fact, some IPCC groups actually do it, they just kind of hide out. They, they don't like it to be obvious. Um, but assessments can also sustain areas of ignorance, and I've given several examples of that. Uh, relatedly, it's important, and I'll get to this again in a minute, assessments are very influential on the future research agenda. So they not only create knowledge internally, but they, gener but they influence the way knowledge is then subsequently uh, 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 developed after the, a particular assessment uh, shuts down. So, and my view, as I said, uh, inhibiting knowledge production is not a good idea. It has to be controlled so the assessment doesn't t turn into, you know, forget its review uh, uh, function, review and evaluation function, but it shouldn't be ignored and needs to be carried on in important cases. Uh, but it has a flip side. If you create new knowledge and assessment, assessments have a review process. They are reviewed but they're not reviewed the same way the peer-reviewed literature is reviewed. So you have to worry about what's the quality of the knowledge. I don't want to go into that anymore right here because we're running short on time. Assessors typically strive to separate science and policy. This has become more and more the case uh, in recent years and probably relates somewhat to the political atmosphere where in an effort, again, just like the effort to develop consensus, the effort to develop enhanced credibility with the public. Assessors stay away from making policy-related decisions, and this is now embedded again in IPCC from the top down. The trouble is that it's really, in the end, impossible to totally separate science from policy. Uh, the reason assessments were set up in the first place is uh, based on a policy motivation. The, inf the questions they answer are directly related to policy, many of them, uh, they're supposed to be. And so uh, <coughs> assessors have some role to play 
which is larger than just saying the scientific facts as we know them are X. And it's important sometimes for scientists to play that role, like someone like Sherry Rowland, who was banned from ozone assessments for quite a while because of his outspoken uh, views on what ought to be done about the problem, when he was allowed back in, ran a very important assessment, ran it perfectly, Chris, uh, you know, crystal clear a role, a message on whether ozone was already being depleted. And um, it, it would have been better off to have him in there from the beginning. It would have been better off for some of those assessments to do with earlier ozone assessments had done, which is make some recommendations which were not specific, like you should control uh, ozone depletion with a, uh, a, a CFC tax. That would be beyond science experts. If we had economists in these assessments, it would have been you know, perfectly sensible to do. But they ought to go to the point of at least saying, this is a life-threatening problem, which basically that's the kind of language they, that I, even IPCC sometimes stays away from. Um, in terms of object, you know, I think I'm going to uh, uh, stop here. There are a couple of other conclusions we could go into about how bias is handled. And one final point I'm, I'm going to make here, which is the whole business of assessment has become so big now that not only does it generate f uh, control, future control, have a heavy influence on future research agendas, but you know, it actually diverts a lot of scientists' time during the uh, process of an assessment going on. So they're doing assessment-targeted science instead of some other type of basic research, which would also be important. And nobody's ever thought about what those trade-offs are. Um, this is an area that needs to be thought about it isn't being thought about, and in the meantime, the whole scientific venture on a problem like climate change has been tilted in a particular direction. I don't know if it's healthy or unhealthy. I'm going to skip that. So that's all I have to say. Uh, I'll come back in five years and report to you on phase two. Thank you. There's probably time for a question or two. We don't want to go overboard too much, right, Bob? Okay, two, people who want to go or have to go can go. Let's have two questions. I'll, go ahead. Okay, so um, one of the, you said, let's look at different models, and obviously one of the ones that's recently been talked about is red team, blue team. Um, I'm assuming you would not be happy with this, maybe because it's about whether it's occurring as opposed to policy prescriptions, or maybe because there's attempts to put people on it who are um, pretty extremely motivated. Or something. Yeah, if red team, blue team were separated from the motivations that the people have, it's an interesting idea. And I've actually said a long time ago to IPCC, why not set up a limited set of these types of A, a team, B team, aimed at one or two particular questions, and just tell them not to talk to each other. These should be questions with large uncertainty, and see what happens. It's part of the process of opening up the assessment process and be able to say, is the current way that we do assessment the best way we can do it? So in, in, the, in an ideal world, there's nothing wrong with red team, blue team. Unfortunately, we don't live in the ideal world. We live in Trump world now. And OK. One more. Nick. You mentioned that with the Western Arctic ice sheet that, um, Western Arctic ice sheet that you know, mayors are responsible to make this. Can I can't say it. Speak a little louder. My question is, what do you think is the right role for assessments uh, in relation to all the other science that's being produced? You know, policymakers have access to Google Scholar, they have staff that can look through literature reviews. What, what is it about assessments in particular that, that you think is the right role for the top? Okay. So what assessments do that an individual can't do is evaluate and make a judgment. You can make a judgment yourself, but there's a different quality of the judgment when you're interacting with other experts. Um, they, and sometimes that quality is to enhance the product, and sometimes it's not. There are these psychological factors, like drifting towards the mean in the room. And so, you know, all that is interesting and needs to be looked at carefully. Uh, you know, I think it works out fine. I don't, I don't see a model that's different than getting people together under some institutional umbrella. My message is not that you have to get rid of the institutional umbrellas because they're going to exist no matter what. We need them. The question is to always be aware of the influence that the particular choices that the inf institutions have on the outcomes. And actually, you know, that the experts themselves should look at those 
constraints and be aware of them and decide to the extent possible, you know, if that interferes with the message that they want to give. And they have a certain, you know, they, they have a certain liberty to stretch beyond those constraints and have many, many times. Okay? Thank you. Any, any t anybody want to email me or come over and talk? I'm, I'm sometimes there. Thank you. <laughs>